وأغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشهد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشهد القائد على المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله First of all I would like to welcome and congratulate you all for treading this path and this is definitely the path of لا إله إلا الله the path of salvation, the path that insha'Allah ta'ala this will lead you to the everlasting and eternal gardens of bliss, joy and happiness. Far from the dungeons of destruction, damnation and terror. For Wallahi, the person who knows is much, much God conscious or Allah conscious than the person who does not know and know that this path that you are treading as we speak the angels who never ever disobey their Lord surround us and seek Allah's forgiveness for us out of love and pleasure for what we are doing and all of Allah's creatures, whether they're in the heavens or they're on the earth, Wallahi, even the fish in the sea, they seek Allah's pleasure and implore Allah's forgiveness for the student of La ilaha illallah. So you can see the greatness, the beauty and the goodness in seeking the acquisition or the recognition or the knowledge of the greatest word that exists la ilaha illallah so greetings to you O lovers of haq O students of paradise insha'Allah ta'ala O students of Islam greetings for taking this shield against the two horned ugly deceiving beast for the person who seeks Islam, the excellence of the one that knows, the learned person, to the ignorant person, or the excellence of the learned man, to a devout worshipper, is wallahi as the hadith says, the excellence of the full moon over all the other planets. Can you imagine that? The excellence of a learned person is like the full moon, the brightness, the light, the glitter, the adornment of that moon. Can you, or have you not seen the moon when it, it's at its fullest? What happens? Fuad? When the moon is full, what happens? It lightens, yes. It lightens the dunya. So the hadith is resembling the man that knows because he's a light for the rest of the people. He's a glitter, an adornment, a beauty for all others around him. This is the similarity that our beloved teacher and leader sallallahu alayhi wa sallam utilize for us to recognize the importance of learning Islam. And knowing this deen is definitely the greatest treasure on the face of this existence. Is it not Yahud al-Baf? Is there any treasure better than this? 
Okay, why is it the greatest treasure? You know, you might say, I've got a treasure box at home, it's got full of gold. And today the gold is worth so much. But is that treasure at home, the treasure of diamonds, bronze, silver, gold, precious stones, pearls, is it the same treasure as seeking la ilaha illallah? Why not? Limada. Sorry? Not a problem. Because the reality is, this treasure is an everlasting treasure. It's eternal, is it not? That treasure, as Khalid said beautifully, that it is restrictive to the dunya, but the treasure of aqua, acquiring la ilaha illallah will take you to, to eternal gardens of joy. So that is the real treasure, isn't it? You know, you want to acquire and acquire a dunya, 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 accumulate. Correct? Why? So you can become happier, more comfortable, uh, more relaxed, easier life. Everything at your fingertips. Khair, not a problem. Have from the dunya what you can have is a halal way. But do you not want to do likewise for al-jannah? as wide as the heavens and the earth? Is this not your rule, inshallah, destination? So acquire it likewise. And the only way you can acquire Jannah, no other way, is understanding who Allah is, why you pray, to whom you pray, in the exact manner, way, that you should pray. This is the way you acquire Jannah. As for those who remain on their sofas at home with the remote control in their hand, flicking from one channel to another, they only know the treasure of shaitan. It's called the satanic treasure. What's it called? The satanic treasure. And they have not, wallahi, taken the shield uh, that will shield them from who? From shaitan. The two horned ugly, the saving beast. Instead, they have said, Tafaddal ya khabith. Tafaddal ya khabith. Ya shaitan. Tafaddal ila bayti. Come in my house and just give me that remote and you choose which or what I watch. Because how many people today, when you say, Akhi, it's a lesson, let's go to a Quran lesson, let's go to a lesson, let's go to this and get close to Allah Ta'ala. Yeah, Akhi, I've got time, no time, he says. No time. What are you doing, brother? Why haven't you got time? Well, I'm watching the grand final today. I'm watching the last, uh, the Commonwealth Games, the Olympic Games, tennis. I haven't got time. And any other balut that exists other than la ilaha illallah. So those people who remain and are ignorant of la ilaha illallah, it is as though they are walking on a path that is completely dark, due to darkness, where Satan can easily deceive, taking him, dragging him to wherever, whenever, however he so desires. For what does knowledge do? It removes a person from the darkness of kufr to the light of Islam. It removes a person from the darkness of shirk to the light of tawheed. It removes a person from the darkness of bid'ah, heresy, novelty, innovation to the light of the sunnah. It removes a person from the darkness of evil wickedness, mischievousness to the light of righteousness and piety. It removes a person from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge. And it removes a person from darkness to light. 
This is what knowledge does. So greetings, O students of Al-Haq, O students of those who love paradise, Al-Firdaus Al-A'la, for taking this path of righteousness. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all among those who enter Al-Firdaus Al-A'la with no punishment, no judgment, no accountability. And this path, my beloved, is a path of worship, an act of worship. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts and that we turn this knowledge that we are taking into action. For ad. will knowledge without action benefit you? It won't. It will be against you. Where would you get that from? You spoke correctly, but where did you get it from? So seeking knowledge and then being stagnant, huh? it will not benefit you. Limada. Again, I said limada. When I say limada, you're an Arab, aren't you? Alhamdulillah. When I say limada, I expect the answer to be with concrete. Not vegetable. You know vegetable soup? I don't want vegetable soup. I want concrete and steel. They cannot be touched. Very good answer. That's half. That's, you can probably say cement. Why will, not, will it not benefit you? Who can tell me? Naz V, why? Why will not knowledge uh, benefit you if it does not entail that which is called action, implementation in one's life. Knowledge plus action. If you take action away, why does knowledge not benefit you? But why does it not benefit you? I want the reason. Does not, he does not recognize it. Why not? Because, in other words, it's a condition. In the Quran, Allah Ta'ala conditioned knowledge and action. Action to knowledge. So knowledge without action, it becomes no knowledge. As for Ad said, it will be against you and not for you. As Hassan al-Basri said beautifully, Iman or Islam is neither formal conformity nor vain expectation. It is what settles in the heart, listen carefully, settles in the heart, internal, inward, implicit, and is confirmed with action. It is what settles in the heart, internal belief, and what is confirmed with action external, outward, explicit evidence what the heart implies or believes in. And since this beautiful deen or this action that you are currently enduring, practicing, is an act of worship, we must all make sure, and this is very, very important, that we are here today for one reason. That our hearts is full of is full of MashaAllah Tabarakallah. Ikhlas. You know what ikhlas is? Sincerity. There's no really word in English for it. Ikhlas is ikhlas. Now when we say ikhlas, I don't mean 99.99999% no. This is not ikhlas. If you've got 99.9999 to the end of the world of ikhlas, you are not performing ikhlas. So what is ikhlas? A hundred percent. In other words, you are here for one reason. I ask him, what's the reason you're here today for? To learn. To learn. So what is the main essence of your existence today here? In this classroom, in Al-Khadim, in Malaysia, in Badalanjaya? 
What is the main reason? To learn, yes, but what is the essence? What is the, the core? For who? Sorry? For whom? I was going to give you a good point there, but I'm going to reject it. Take it back. For Allah. You knew it. Sometimes the easy, yeah. Sometimes the easy questions are too easy that you try to think it could be something else. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. It happens to me all the time. And there are questions some are so easy to answer, but you say it's too easy. That answer is too easy. There must be something involved there. It must become kind of trickery. But Zakallah, I knew you had it all in there. The computer was a bit slow today. So the heart must be full of? And like I said, ikhlas is not 99.9. .9, it is what? 100% for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, we are not here for the gratification of the mind or the senses. We are not here. We don't practice or pursue Islam. Or the acquisition of Islam, the knowledge of Islam, with boastfulness or ostentation or rancor or arrogance or wanting to exceed above others or wastage. And we definitely not pursue this path and learn this path for the reckless pursuit of higher standards of material living. You understand what I'm saying here? There are many people out there that learn Islam so they can be teachers and then it entails a job, a salary. We are not here for that reason. And likewise, there are many out there that learn Islam to be called a sheikh, a eminent, a alim, a scholar, his eminence, al-fadila, they say. We are not here for that reason. And there are people out there that love to learn Islam so they can argue with the fuqaha or they can defame or shame the ignorant. We are not here for that reason. We are here for one reason. To know who Allah is. Purely, solely for the countenance, the pleasure of the Almighty Allah. This is the only reason we are here. To understand how the real worship of Allah should be. Ikhlas, 100%. And one of the most beautiful teachings of Islam has been beautifully captured in a hadith collected by Muhammad ibn Ismail al Bukhari on the authority of Al Farooq Abu Hafs, Umar ibn al Khattab, radiyallahu ta'ala an. That our beloved Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Innama al-a'malu Naam. Innama al-a'malu You attended the first lesson. You have no excuse whatsoever. Innama al-a'malu Bil Niyat Wa innama likulli imri'in Zaki Wa innama likulli imri'in Zaki not Zaki, he doesn't say Zaki. I'm saying Zaki, complete. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ عزوان Abdullah مَا نَوَى This is a hadith that should be known to every single one that claims he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in this narration it tells you that all actions are but by intention. And you shall receive the reward of that which you intended. This is one of the most important teachings in Islam. This hadith reminds us against and warns us against contaminating our motives, contaminating our intentions with the lows of this deceiving materialistic world. Glory, fame, honor, boastfulness, status, position, rank, reputation, recognition, love for worldly pursuits, wanting to exceed above others. 
Subhanallah, isn't it scary? Is it not scary? Wallahi it is. That all our good deeds can be simply wiped out due to a corruption in our motive. Due to a corruption in this morsel here, your heart, your intention, everything that you do good may be wiped out due to a corruption in your motive. Obliterated, eradicated, annihilated. Finit toda musica. Finished. Simply due to a love of this dunya that has tarnished, that has tainted, that has covered your original intention, which is for Allah Ta'ala, and thus finished. All wasted. This is why we must realize the danger of this. Don't say that you are, no, I'm all right, I'm good enough. I have no uh, interest uh, in desiring anything to do with the dunya. Garbage, gibberish. You are weak, you are deficient, you are a human being. It happens to every single individual. If the companions, radiallahu anhum, and those that came after them, the righteous forebears, they were extremely scared of their intentions. Sufyan Authority, one of the great predecessors, said, One thing I had most trouble in treating, and that was my intention. Sufyan Authority is a mountain of faith, a mountain of knowledge, an ocean of understanding. Yet he was scared that this intention may slightly deviate to other than Allah. So never ever think of yourself as being, no, I'm okay. No problem. I will never ever divert my intention. Instead, say, inshallah, it doesn't happen. And say, astaghfirullah, repeatedly every single day. For we are humans and we are weak. And Allah created us in this manner. And shaitan will always try to invade you, attack you. That's why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, and he would always say to his students, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who is he? Who is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud? Anyone know? A companion, one of the masters of companions, the most knowledgeable of companions, Abu Abdul Rahman, Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala an, one of the great teachers, and bodybuilders of Islam. He said to his students, if you are seeking knowledge from me for one of these three reasons, leave right now. One, to shame the ignorant. Two, to argue with the fuqaha. Three, to desire that people's faces come in your direction. What does that mean? To desire customers, in other words. Quantity. No quality, quantity. If the reason that you are here today is for one of these three reasons, then don't sit in my sitting. For this will lead you to the dungeons of terror. And likewise, we know the saying of Ibn Qayyim. Anasvi, the saying of Ibn Qayyim that mentions that deeds without sincerity is like what? Did you have your wheat bigs this morning? You know wheat bigs? Yeah. yeah, they're very good, aren't they? I'll tell you what, they're Iron Man food. You know what they are? They're Iron Man food. Cereal. Yes. What do you reckon, Ali? The Iron Man food, wheat bigs? Absolutely. Deeds without sincerity is like? Uh -huh. You actually asked me that question about this narration once upon a time. But unfortunately that once upon a time has become history that has evaded, finished, evaporated. But it should never evaporate. It should always remain like the slab remains underneath a home. Holding strongly the structure. 
and the structure is Islam. Days of our sincerity is like a traveler carrying in his sand. Uh -huh. Carrying the sand. Carrying in what? Very good. Very good. Carrying in his water jug sand. Listen to Ibn Al-Qayyim and understand this. Deeds without sincerity is like a traveler carrying in his water jug dirt. What does this mean for it? Who dirt are they all? The person in the middle of the desert when he's in dire need of water, when he's almost dying from thirst, will sand avail him? So what is the understanding of this beautiful golden statement that we should understand fully and make sure that we do not get affected by it? Huh? Exactly. Tabarakal, you're doing well today. It must have been that fall of spirit. It is in reality uh, a person with no sincerity in his acts of worship is like drinking dirt. A man in the desert is about to die and his water, but will that dirt avail him, benefit him? It's only going to destroy him. Likewise, if your heart is not full of ikhlas, which is the water, it will be full of uh, shirk. Because you're doing it for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is not going to benefit you. It's going to destroy you. This is the example that Ibn al-Qayyim mentions. And we all know the famous hadith of our beloved teacher, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that mentions the first three people to enter hellfire dragged on their faces. Now these people were supposedly righteous. Believers known for their virtuous deeds. So what was the problem? One of them was extremely charitable. He gave a lot of money, a tremendous amount of money. The second of them was a man who studied the Quran, memorized the Quran, and then taught the Quran. Well, the third one was a person who fought and died on the, on the battlefield. Is there any more virtue than this? So what was the problem? On the day of resurrection, Allah Ta'ala will question these three men. And they'll be the first three to enter the dungeons of terror. What was their reason? What was the problem? Brother Azmi. Their intention. Their intention. Why did you do this action? Wallahi for your sake, ya Allah. No. It was not for my sake. Not for my countenance. Not for my pleasure. It was for your intention. For the reason of wanting to be called, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. You want to boast and be pumped and called a mujahid or a charitable person. Or a scholar of the Quran, and it was called. You will call that. And they will be dragged into the dungeons of damnation. See the importance of ikhlas. <coughs> so being here today, and throughout our lessons to be, inshallah ta'ala, make sure that your the reason behind today and every other time is for the sake and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for any other reason. Another important factor that I would like to mention that is a condition that must be fulfilled in order any act of worship to be accepted is following the footsteps of, of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And today we see so much dissension so much disagreement, so much friction, tension, animosity, and hatred amongst our ranks. And wallahi, this is definitely 
by straying away from the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No other reason. No other reason. Many Muslims are very negligent when it comes to following Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Many Muslims, and it's sad to say, the majority believe that it is only optional when it comes to Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Mistakenly estimating that obedience to him is only admirable, rewardable, optional, and that is it. But they fail to realize that following him strictly is a condition, a critical condition that must be fulfilled for any act of worship to be accepted. And we all know the beautiful narration that Bukhari had collected on the authority of Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu known to all of us by Abu Huraira that our beloved teacher and leader Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and we've all heard this many times we've heard this narration many times but this narration must be engraved on our souls it must run through our bloodstream and must be understood and implemented when he said to us كل أمة يدخلون الجنة إلا من أبا كلا ومن يأبى يا رسول الله قال من أطاعني دخل الجنة ومن عصاني دخل النار you're an Arab aren't you? you're not an Arab? you look like an Arab no, no wonder why you look like an Arab Allah, those who lived in the Arab countries, although they are not natively Arab, still look like Arabs. Isn't it amazing? Listen to this beautiful translation. Subhanallah. All of my nation shall enter paradise. What glad tiding! What good tiding! What a beautiful statement! Are we not from the nation of Muhammad? Well, he has given us the glad tidings that we shall all enter Jannah, paradise. However, he then entails this statement of something else. Illa man aba. Except those who refuse. Now, Asim, who in the world will refuse Al Firdaus Al A'la? He must be a spastic or an idiot uh, to refuse Jannah. Correct? Correct? There's no other better term to give him. He must be an, a man of insanity, a dumb man to refuse Al Jannah. But the answer is there. That's why the companions ask, Ya Rasulullah, who in the world will refuse? You know, who would refuse such an offer? The answer comes. Whosoever obeys me has accepted Jannah. And whosoever disobeys me has refused. Is this not a beautiful narration? Honestly. Is this not a narration, a statement, a saying of gold? The meaning is such, it's so beautiful, so meaningful, so goldish. It means that if we obey Rasulullah, we go to where? If we obey him, where do we go? To Jannah. So why in the world? Would anyone want to disobey him? And then he says, Man asani, fakad abba. But the one who disobeys me, who refuses my way, who does not like my way, who chooses to blind follow other than me, has refused. In other words, refused what? Refused what? Shanna. Jannah. We're not talking about a five-star resort here. We're talking about Al-Fardaw. 
walls, gardens beneath which withers flow. And Malik ibn Anas, one of the great scholars, as you all know, clearly and beautifully illustrates and explains this narration when he said that the Sunnah of Rasulullah is like the Ark of the Ark of who? Abraham or Muhammad? The Ark of Astaghfirullah al Azim. Abdullah. The Ark of? No. The Sunnah, he says, is like the Ark of Noah. Whoever embarks it is saved. But whoever does not embark it is destroyed, drowned, kaput. Khalas. Allahu Musta'an. He is gone. He is finished. Destruction. Terror, damnation, punishment, torture. Simple. Is it not simple? This is Islam. So I would like to remind you, as we are heading, inshallah ta'ala, in our lessons, teaching about Tawheed, but making sure that we abide by these two conditions. Sincerity and following the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The book, insha'Allah ta'ala, that shall be the center of our studies is a famous book known to all of you as Kitab al-Tawheed. This book is one of the greatest and most comprehensive book written on the subject of Tawheed. The beauty of this book, as you so see, insha'Allah ta'ala, is that every single chapter initiates with either a Quranic verse or a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or sometimes even both. So in other words, every chapter, there is nothing in the book but call Allah wa call Rasulullah. There's no saying, call Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, a, B, C? No. It's but call Allah wa call Rasulullah. Should anyone have a problem with that? Should there be a problem with that? If a book has been written with no other but call Allah, call Rasulullah, should anyone have a problem? Absolutely not. The only one that will have a problem, yes, Muhammad, is Shaitan. He does not want this kind of writing. The author, his name is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, ibn Sulaiman, ibn Ali, ibn Muhammad, ibn Ahmad, ibn Rashid at Tamimi. When was he born? One, 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 five after the migration, which is equivalent to one, seven, zero, three, AA. Why do I say AA for Ali? Because, you know, many people say, before I, sorry to cut you off, many do say, CE, Christian era. I don't like that. I don't accept that. I prefer to say, which is an innovation, but I, inshallah ta'ala, no such thing as a good innovation, a linguistic innovation, not an Islamic innovation. I put down AA. Why? What does it stand for? Ahsan Allah ilayk. AA means after the ascension. The ascending of whom? Of Isa alayhi salam. So you're better saying AA than saying CE or whatever other EE. Say AA after the ascendance or ascension. He was born in a village called Uyayna in Arabia. Not Saudi Arabia. It was not going to say Saudi Arabia then. Arabia is a better term. A better name for it. Why did he write this book? Just a brief history about this great man so you can understand. He wrote the book because at the time, Arabia was infested with all sorts of repugnant bid'ah, innovations, novelties, heresies, blatant kufr and shirk. 
Arabia was in such an evil state and abroad that no true sincere believer could ever accept. Ignorance in all aspects of life had dominated or afflicted the Islamic world. And then, from the heart of this disorder, this darkness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can say, sent this man with this beautiful voice of no other than call Allah, call Rasulullah. So when he saw the evil that is surrounding his people, that is surrounding him, what did he do? As any person will do, any Muslim, he immediately started calling to that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded from the first Rasul to the last Rasul. Who was the first Rasul for it? Adam, huh? first Rasul. Nuh. The first Rasul was Nuh. To the last Rasul, and who's he? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is teaching them pure Tawheed based on no other than the Quran and the Sunnah. So when people started hearing this, they flocked towards him. Even those people of innovation, because they were blinded. They were clouded. They did not understand right from wrong. But when they heard Islam for the first time, without the adulteration of superstition, of innovation, of tradition and custom, of falsehood and fables, they accepted the Shaykh's call based on the Quran and the Sunnah. At 91 years old, the Shaykh died. But bifadlillahi ta'ala, all of Hijaz and most of the Arabian Peninsula had unified on Tawheed. And this was Shaykh Ibn Abdul Wahhab in a nutshell, which is all you need to know. Did he have critics, enemies? This is the question. You know, we know the beautiful hadith in Bukhari that mentions. لا تزال طائفة من أمة قائمة على الحق لا يضرهم من خالفهم ولا من خذلهم حتى يأتي أمر الله. The hadith says they will always remain. Listen carefully. They shall always remain a group of my people, my community, my nation that is fighting for the truth, that is upholding the truth. That is steadfast on the path of truth, undeterred, unharmed by those who oppose them, by those who fight them, and they'll continue doing so until death comes to them or the establishment of the hour. So, definitely, when anyone wants to call to the Haq, Allah will examine you, He will test you. So, back then, when he initiated the call of Haq, the ruling entities of falsehood, then and now, defamed, destructively and derogatively criticized, slandered, disparaged, belittled, insulted, offended, this great scholar. Now, for Ad, if a person has been accused, of blasphemy and he was accused of blasphemy what would we do okay example of this dunya today a person is accused of murder what do you do Khalas, you grab him and you put him in jail because Ahmad said he murdered someone is that what would you do what would you do trial. sorry uh, put, him put him to trial take him to court where's the prosecutor where's the defense Where's the judge? And our judge is who? Allah Ta'ala. So when we look at this in such a manner, okay, you people are calling him ABC. Let us see why you are attacking him. What is the reason? You know, all we have is this beautiful book. Wallahi, whoever reads this book will say, Subhanallah, what a beautiful book built on no other than Qal Allah, Qal Rasulullah. So you cannot use this 
as evidence for your reproval or your rebuttal or your rebuke. Nonsense. But they use this. They use his style of dawah, his method, his methodology. So when we take it to court and see why they attacked him, wallahi, they should be all whipped, flogged, and imprisoned until they repent. Not Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, but who? His enemies. They were enemies to him. Enemies of the Sunnah. Because the core of their attack, their argument is gibberish, is nonsense. They are not attacking this great scholar. Wallahi, they are attacking the greatest book on the face of his existence, which is the Quran. This is what they're attacking. Because the only thing he spoke of was the Quran and the Sunnah. How dare you attack the Quran and Sunnah? So those people have no arguments, no evidence or proof for their innovated actions had no argument. But to call him or anyone that follows his methodology with, with Wahhabi. So what does Wahhabi mean? Zaki, who is putting his head down and reading his phone, what does the Wahhabi term mean? What does Wahhabi mean? Naam ya Habibi, ya Azizi. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Where did you get that definition from? Well, now, I'm not saying what who or be said. I'm saying what does it mean? Someone comes up to you, Zaki, and says, Ya yeah, Habibi, ya Shaykh. What does Wahhabi? I was called a Wahhabi. What in the world is Wahhabi? What will be your response? Nazvi is really hated here. He wants to answer the question. I can see him scratching and looking at me saying, Please, Shaykh, give me a chance. Should we give it to him? Sure? Okay. Khalas. It's yours now. I can't, now I can hear you. Isn't it? Even the jinn can't hear you. Linguistically? Since when is there a linguistic definition for Wahhabi? This must be written in the books. I've never heard that one before. Aha! Aha! MashaAllah! Tabarakallah! That is correct. In reality, Wahhabi, the term, is a meaningless appellation, title, accusation, allegation, utilized by people to slander, insult, offend, Criticize, defame, disparage those who strictly uphold the Sunnah of Rasulullah. I knew you were scratching for that answer. But let us look at the reality of it. To the majority of the world, there is a very little understanding of the term Wahhabi. Some say that it's a myth. You know, in other words, there's no such thing as Wahhabi, they say. Others say, no, 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 there is such a thing. Everyone and anyone who believes in the name or the attribute that comes out of Al-Wahhab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to the majority, it has a negative and pejorative connotation. As we said, to the majority of people, when they say Wahhabi, they mean to offend or insult or defame others. And especially those who uphold the Quran and Sunnah. But if you are, for example, called Wahhabi, you ask the person, Ya Akhi, Ya Akhti, I'm sorry, what in the world does that mean? Those that slander this, by with this name, you ask them, what in the world does this term mean? And they will be quiet, silent. They would not have a clue in the world. So why in the world would you utilize a term you do not understand what you are saying? Isn't that insanity? Isn't that stupid? You idiot! You're calling me Wahhabi, but you don't know what it means? 
Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's disgusting that you do such a thing. But as we said earlier on, Shaykh Nazvi mentioned, it is nothing but a meaningless appellation. Okay, so where did it come from? Shaykh Ali, where did the Wahhabi come from? You know, we knew it's a meaningless appellation. There's no existence in reality for this term. But where in the heck did it come from? Acceptable, partially acceptable, partially acceptable. It is no more. Naam, ya Habibi. Okay. You know, in Islam, it's not very good to say. It's actually good that you mention that we can learn something. It's not good to say, I want to have a guess. If you know that it could be right, say it. But when we guess, Islam is no guessing. Islam is not a puzzle. Now we can guess this, we can guess that. It's concrete. It's a good, strong, still slab. You know it, alhamdulillah, you say it. There's no, I think, or my opinion. No. Islam, no offense, I'm not talking to you. Islam is not built on opinion. Islam is not built on guessing. Islam is built on authenticity. Affirmation. Consolidation. Uh, strong. That cannot be touched or broken. This is Islam. Now, you still guessing? That's a question. Okay. Was, was it invented by the But you're asking me a question. Yeah. I haven't even, we haven't got the answer for the first question yet. Fuad. Astaghfirullah al azim. What's the question? Was it invented by the British to create division among the <laughs> We're asking the same question and now you're. Rephrasing it with another question. Okay. Akhuna Fuad is asking, was it a conspiracy by the British? Is that the question? Yes, and that's the answer. Definitely, without any shadow of a doubt, the English conspired against Islam. Why? Because they were scared. Of whom? Of whom? They were scared, not of Islam in reality. Of? Who? Uh -huh. They were scared of the Muslims. Which Muslims? Those who strongly adhere unconditionally to the Quran and Sunnah. Knowing that these Muslims fled, knowing that these Muslims they do never ever compromise or water or dilute or waver their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala due to worldly pursuits. So they were scared. They were afraid of an Islamic revolution, an Islamic reawakening or revival. So what did they do, Muhammad? When they got scared, what did they do? Very good. In order to disunite, to weaken, to cause hatred, tension, friction, animosity in the ranks of the Muslims, they created this appellation and named it Wahhabi. To insinuate that this is a dangerous movement and its da'wah must be eradicated. A dangerous movement that must be stopped and its da'wah be eradicated. Why? Because Allah Ta'ala told us that they will do things like this. In Surah Al-Saf, verse 28, They wish, they intend, to put out the light of Allah Ta'ala with their mouths. But Allah will not allow except His light be completed. Would you not like to be the one that completes His light? How can you complete His light? How? Huh? How can we in reality be amongst those 
who assists, not that he needs us, but amongst those who helps in this light. Very good. By learning the Quran and Sunnah and proclaiming, preaching, propagating the grace of the Almighty to all those around you. This is the way. You know, we learn here today, for example, what do we do after this? Go home and put it in the closet or in the big safe? Which one? You know how we've got big safes to hide our money? Do we put it in the closet like that or the safe after we learn? Do we put it in our safe here? No! We go and teach! And teach! And this is the way that you will be helping yourselves and helping Islam, inshaAllah. So this is the definition of the meaning of the conspiracy known as Wahhab. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Alhamdulillah. Okay, what are we up to? What do you reply with if anyone calls you or labels you as a Wahhabi? Who's going to tell me? What do you reply, Abdullah? Ya Abdullah. If someone comes and labels you as a Wahhabi, what would you say to him? Or what would you say to her? Okay. You don't get a big sledgehammer and just flog him? Huh? There are a lot of Muslims that would love to do that, believe me. Is that what you would do? What would you do? Okay, you ask him for the definition. First, what else you would do? Huh? Okay, so are you all happy? Would you agree to it? But what would you do? What would you say to this person? You know, obviously this person is ignorant. Otherwise he would not call you that. But the ignorance needs to be relinquished, destroyed, fixed up, rectified. So what would you do? Say, Ya Akhi, Ya Akhi, don't go crazy and angry and this and that and start yelling. No. Do it with a nice way of wisdom. I'm not a Wahhabi. What does Wahhabi mean in the first place? Where did you get it from? Why do you use it? Explain to people. Teach people. Don't be harsh and say, Yes, I'm a Wahhabi. You're an innovator. I'm going to flog you right now. No. That's destruction. We want to better ourselves, not detriment ourselves, correct? So explain and teach fair preaching with wisdom. That's the only way, insha'Allah ta'ala, to a good, prosperous da'wah, da'i. So clarify the situation to that person. Number 10. Tawheed, the natural belief, which is al-fitrah. We all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created Adam, he extracted from the loin of Adam all of his descendants. And then he engraved or imprinted on them that which is known as Al-Fitrah. Correct? So what is Al-Fitrah? The natural belief. The natural disposition. The innate nature, the inclination of faith, the origin of man, which is Tawheed. This is the fitrah. And this was explained to us by our beloved teacher Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when Allah created Adam, he extracted all of his descendants that shall live on the face of this earth. This is before our earthly existence. All of us. Every single man and woman that were extracted from the loin of Adam before our earthly existence, after the creation of Adam, he placed all of us in front of him. And what did he do, Ya Khalid? Okay, when he placed us in front of him, what did he do? In Surah Al Araf, verse. Verse, O oh, people who attended the first lesson, Surah Al Araf, verse 172. 
after you looked at it, huh? Verse 172, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says to us all, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْحَدُهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ شَهِدْنَا أَنْ تَكُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ And remember, when Allah took from the loin of Adam all of his descendants, and he placed us, them, the offspring of Adam, in front of him. And he made them testify, us, testify, saying, Am I not your Lord? Understand this very carefully. Am I not your Lord? He said to us. We said, Bala shahidna. Yes, you are our Lord. You are the only one worthy of worship. Why? Lest you should say on the day of resurrection, Lest you should say on the day of resurrection, we were unaware of this. And this is the fitrah. This testimony, this declaration, this utterance, us confirming the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or between us and Allah ta'ala that yes, Ya Allah, you are our Lord, the only one worthy of worship. This is engraved on the soul, imprinted on the soul of every human being before his earthly existence. And as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in authentic narration collected in the Sahihain, that every single child is born on the fitrah. And then his parents change him, convert him to being a Jew, Christian, Jew, Christian, <laughs> Zoroastrian, Majusi, yes, a Zoroastrian. See, Listen carefully here to the narration. Take notice. The parents will convert him, change him to what? To a Jew, a Christian, or a Zoroastrian. Why did he not say to a Muslim? Karim. Why did the hadith not say, that's what I'm asking you, why did the hadith not say to a Muslim? Absolutely brilliant because we were born as Muslims. There's no need to say, Oh, they will convert him to Muslim. He's already a Muslim. There's no need to say, Oh, convert him to a Muslim. That's why when someone enters Islam, what do you say? Conversion or reversion? Reversion. Why? Because he's reverting or she's reverting back to her essence. There are out there people, ask him. There are people out there that claim to be atheists, agnostics, communists, or any other person that denies of the existence of a creator. Is that true? Yeah, there are people that. Okay. The question is, do they really deny the existence of a creator? Do they really deny the existence of Allah, of a God, of an entity that created them? From the hearts, Hasim. Really we just answered your question, Hasim. Uh, they do say it. They can say a lot of things. They can say black is white and white is black. But do we accept that? Yeah, they're not being sincere. Aha, very good. I accept that one. They are not being sincere. In other words, in reality, deep under, uh, they believe in a creator. And why do they believe in the Creator? Where do you get the answer for that? We all mention love and nature and laws. No, 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 no. We mentioned that already. Why do we say that these people that claim that, that there's no existence of a Creator, how would you rebuke them? How? We mentioned that already. In a few hadith, in a verse. So, how would you rebuke that belief? That there are people in reality 
that do not believe in a creator. How would you rebuke that? Abdullah is smiling. You want to give it to him? Give it to him? Okay. He loves for his brother what he loves for himself. What would you say? Uh -huh. The covenant that took place in Al Arab, verse 172. And the hadith that says that every child is born on the future. Astaghfirullah al You can't remember? Your heart remembers whether you like it or not. This small soul definitely remembers in the essence that there is a creator. Wallahi, my beloved Asim, in a Sydney Daily Telegraph newspaper, even the animals remember. The animals, even the ant that you tramp on day after day remembers. And there are animals, insects, inanimate creatures. In the newspaper, on the front page, there was a bear going like this, Ya Rabbi. A polar bear. No, they don't remember taking the cup. Your heart remembers of the essence. Of course you don't remember of going out of the loin of Adam, standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, we testify. No one remembers that. But your body, don't you have always hope? Hope? Isn't there something called hope? How do you think Abu Hanifa and Nu'mar Muthabit Used to be, he used to always argue with the avowed atheists. Avowed atheists. Do you know how he fought them? Do you know how he argued with them? Through the essence of life, the fitrah. And he removed the doubt of the majority of those he argued with, and they became Muslims. Through this covenant that we do not remember. Because every single person in reality has hope. And that hope, in essence, is a hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is in there, even though you don't remember the essence of the, the testimony. Yes. Yes. I believe I can't believe Yes. Beautiful, Ya Muhammad. See that? Brother Hassim, everyone, everyone, single person, they know they wonder that there is a, there's a creator. They know. There's no doubt about that. We don't remember the essence of the testimony, but deep inside you all believe that there is a creator. This is not my saying. This is the hadith that says that we were all born on the fitrah. The innate nature, the inclination of faith, the natural disposition, the natural belief, no, I'm, yeah. uh, my, my boss is American. He yes. Says, he has no religion, but he says it has to be uh, God. There you go. There you go. There you go. So Tawheed in reality is the first thing that we enter this existence with. And if you want salvation and you want to be saved from eternal destruction, it must be the only thing that you exit this life with. And Tawheed in reality is composed in the testimony of faith, the declaration of faith. La ilaha illallah. This is the essence of Tawheed. There is no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This declaration is the bedrock the core, the foundation of Islam. These words are the most significant words that exist in this existence. These words, this testimony, is what is the decisive criterion by which man is judged to be a Muslim or Kafir. La ilaha illallah. That's why Shaykh al-Islam Ahmad ibn Abdul Halim ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala he said in his beautiful book Al-Fatawa Majmu' Al-Fatawa for la ilaha illallah or for Tawheed Allah ta'ala created the heavens and the earth created night and day created the mountains and the earth created the grass and the rivers for la ilaha illallah he said 
Allah Ta'ala created the human and jinn the day of resurrection and he kept on going until he said for la ilaha illallah you are here therefore it is very important he said to understand la ilaha illallah as it is the essence of your existence but today we see many Muslims who believe that the mere utterance of this testimony will make them Muslims therefore they will be eligible for paradise is this correct Nazvi it's not correct it's correct so the mere utterance of la ilaha illallah without anything else will get me into Jannah no it's not correct but many Muslims believe so and this in fact is contrary to the Quran and Sunnah Wallahi whoever believes that this declaration this utterance and only this utterance will get you to Jannah this will lead you to no other than failure and destruction so what is our duty what is our obligation to this utterance of salvation this testimony of Jannah insha'Allah ta'ala this declaration of light how are we supposed to utter it and how are we supposed to believe in it let us turn back the pages in history to the golden days of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam how did they understand it and if we compare the way they understood it to the way we understand it today wallahi there is a huge gulf of difference do you not want to understand ya azwan la ilaha illallah the same way abu bakr as-siddiq did or umar al-farooq or dhu nurain uthman or abu turab ali ibn abi talib or sayfullah or sumayya or ammar or yasir or khabbab or bilal or many other shining beacons is this not the way you would like to understand it or would you like to understand it the way your father or grandfather understood it when the companions declared la ilaha illallah it was a declaration an utterance of acknowledgement of understanding of recognition of knowledge of certainty of sincerity of love submission compliance of acceptance an utterance that came from the depths of their hearts wallahi unshakable faith in the almighty allah this is the way they declared la ilaha illallah not the way we declare it today wallahi this is the way they declared it and this is the way we should declare it look at bilal Bilal, Allahu Akbar, who was a slave, embraced Islam, defying his master, saying, Ahad, Ahad, despite the burning sand underneath his back, the huge boulder on his chest, and yet it was pressed and it was burning him from underneath. And he kept saying, Allah is one. Ahad, Ahad defying that evil chief of Quraysh and the more he was punished the stronger he became why because he understood la ilaha illallah he acknowledged la ilaha illallah he implemented la ilaha illallah look at Khabbab the great companion placed on a cross crucified adhering adhering strongly with full conviction with full belief and certainty to la ilaha illallah despite being tortured with red hot iron to every part of his body and he would keep saying la ilaha illallah what a punishment is being perpetrated against him he only grew stronger and stronger la ilaha illallah Sumayyah, the wife of Yasir, the mother of Ammar, a woman, an old lady, 
the first martyr in Islam, being stretched and stretched by the father of wickedness, evil, mischievousness, the Satan himself, Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance. He was stretching her. And yet she did not waver or give in, but she fully submitted, saying, La ilaha illallah, spitting in his face. You are the friends of Satan. I will never say, Bellati wal uzza, as he demanded from her. Until, Wallahi, the noise of the bones getting pulled out of her joints were heard. And she kept saying, La ilaha illallah. Until the spear was driven through her midsection. But did she waver? No. Isbir ali yasir fa inna maw'idukum al jannah. Be patient, as the hadith says, O family of Yasir, for Allah, you promised hell, paradise. You promised paradise. And they were patient. The Ansar, the Muhajirun, look at the immigrants who forsook their wives, their children, their most prized possessions in Mecca, abandoning everything they ever owned, their most, their most luxurious items, their family. And then they traveled through the rough terrain from Mecca to Medina. The rough terrain! Not in five star resort airplanes, no! Wallahi, with no provision except one. They only carried one thing with them. What was that thing? La ilaha illallah. Is not this what you want to utter it and believe in it? You know, let us put ourselves in the same situation. Can we do this? You should talk to yourself. Ask yourself. Could you endure what they endured? This was no more than exams. A trial. Tribulation. Can you please, Muhammad, stop that to Lord Noah? Can you see the importance of understanding La ilaha illallah in the correct mannerism, in the correct way, with the correct belief? Can you see what it does to a person's life? It transforms their lives. Look at Umar ibn Khattab. Allahu Akbar. This mountain of faith. This mountain of Iman, of Taqwa. When he was migrating to Medina, what did he do? Did he hide himself? Did he conceal himself? No. He armed himself with his shield and sword, performed tawaf, prayed behind the Abrahamic station, Maqam Ibrahim, and then he proclaimed out loud to the people, the chiefs of Quraysh, I am now migrating, migrating for La ilaha illallah. Whosoever, he said, once his mother bereaved, or his children orphans, or his wife a widow, let him follow me behind his valley. Did anyone follow him? Did anyone follow him, Khalid? No. Because La ilaha illallah was firmly fixed, engulfed, enveloped around the whole of his heart. Not partially, the whole of his heart. Now, this is them and this is us. You know, they realize the great and the immense power of the Almighty Allah. They knew that every second of their lives was continually, constantly, perpetually directed and guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If only we can model a generation as such so we can cleanse this ummah today, this ummah of dunya, this ummah of love, of materialism, of luxury. If only we can model a similar generation so we can cleanse it from the claws of materialism, the claws of heresy, the claws of ignorance, the claws of jahiliyyah, 
the claws of shirk and kufr, the claws of blasphemy, the squalor of evil wickedness. This is what we are in today. So, how would we like to utter and understand this declaration? Would you not like to utter it and understand it and implement it like Khabab? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So basically, in order for us to understand that better, the scholars have placed conditions that must be observed and acknowledged for the utterer of la ilaha illallah for it to be accepted as Wahab ibn Munabbih a righteous forebear was asked Ya Imam al-Mu'mineen is not the key to Jannah la ilaha illallah he said yes but then he said every key has teeth ridges and if you come on a day of resurrection with the run teeth on that key, it will not open the door for you to Jannah. It will not open the door to eternal bliss and happiness. SubhanAllah, how scary. Isn't it scary? You're carrying la ilaha illallah, but the ridges are not the correct conditions. Or not the fulfilled conditions of la ilaha illallah. So under the resurrection, when you try to open that door, it's not going to open for you. So the scholars have placed seven conditions in order for us to understand la ilaha illallah. These conditions must be observed and acknowledged for you to be accepted bi idnillah ta'ala. In Al Firdaus Al A'la, in Sha Al Khalik Azza wa Jal. The first condition is Al Ilmu. Have we taken this? Yeah? What does not what does the ilmu mean then? Knowledge. Is there proof for this? Not anymore. <laughs> Allah says in Surah Muhammad. Verse 19 Know that it is only Allah worthy of worship. Know that Allah is the only one worthy of worship and then seek forgiveness for your deeds. And the hadith says in Bukhari on the authority of Abu Huraira that Muhammad said Whoever dies knowing La ilaha illallah will enter paradise. Now, knowing it doesn't mean just, oh, I know La ilaha illallah, that only Allah is worthy of khalas. No. Knowing it means knowing Allah. Knowing what is obligated upon you uh, to do so you can know Allah in reality with full implementation. So, whoever says this and dies knowing Allah, Knowing la ilaha illallah, in reality, we enter paradise bi idnillahi ta'ala. As one scholar nicely put it, he said, a person that utters la ilaha illallah, says la ilaha illallah, but does not know its meaning, it's like a person speaking a language he does not understand. I'll give you an example. If I declare every day, bushi hushi rushi, it's a language, whatever language it is, it's a language, correct? It's a language? What language is it, Ali? Eskimos. Eskimos. MashaAllah. What does it mean? Who told you it's the Eskimos? You have an Eskimo family? All right. Oshi, hushi. Is this going to benefit me? Why is it not going to benefit me? Who can tell me? Allah, what it means, what I'm saying. Huh? what it entails to what the contents is who have a clue in the world so the person that says la ilaha illallah likewise does not know what it stands for what it contains what the means of it is would it benefit him no it's not going to benefit him what we must understand which many people don't 
The Shahada, the declaration of faith, is a testimony. It's a what? A what? A testimony. In other words, you are testifying to something. So surely, surely, brothers and sisters, you must know what you're testifying to for it to be accepted. For a testimony without recognition and understanding is absolutely rejected. You know, you are called to the testimony, for a testimony, in the, as a witness. And the judge says to you, or the prosecutor, or the defense lawyer says to you, okay, do you testify to this? And you say anything and whatever. Okay, what are you testifying to? Oh, I don't know, I just thought like saying it. Is that acceptable? I don't know, Allah, I don't know. You would be put in a, a, a mad institution, a spastic center, an institution of madness, insanity, stupidity. And this is the person who utters the testimony without knowing what he is testifying to. The testimony of faith is set of two words, is combined of two words. You want to erase that, please, uh, Nazvi? The Shahada, La ilaha illallah, has two main fundamentals, you can say, in it, or components. Let us see what they are. Okay, that's enough. I'll do one more, number four. Now get the marker and put La ilaha illallah. In the Arabic understanding, we have here, you can say, two components of what this actually means. It's made up of set, two sets of words. The first one, okay, Nazri. Nazri. The first one is engagement, huh? Negation and rejection. Negation and rejection. Well, the second one is affirmation and acceptance. Now here, this is La ilaha illallah. It's made up of this and of that. Here, we're negating La ilaha. There is no deity. There is no God. There is no worshipped one or thing. But then we are saying something else. We're exempting something that is Allah, except Allah. We're affirming, we're accepting that the only one that is exempted from this rejection and negation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, but in reality we say, what do we really need to negate or reject in order for us to affirm and accept Allah as the only true God worthy of worship. Who can tell me? What do we really need to believe in and acknowledge and implement in order for us to reject what or negate what so we can affirm and accept Allah as the only God worthy of worship? We need to negate, reject, Everything, anything that is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to reject, to negate, to push away, to destroy the worship of anything and everything that is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is, for example, grave worshipping, seeking the assistance from the jinn, the prophets, the graves. One's internal desires. Go into those imposters, the magicians, and believe in them. Huh? Go into the soothsayers, the fortune tellers, and their likes. Believing that they know the unseen. This is all shirk. And if you do things like that, although you say, La ilaha illallah, it is rejected. Because you have not negated this section here. By you believing in that people know the unseen, you are still a kafir, a mushrik. Because you are not negating the first side of the declaration, the first phrase. 
You know, Allah, there were people, Muslims, to not long ago, they were having yearly, week-long celebrations, Muslims, to the gods of the sea. Did you hear about this? Muslims, so-called Muslims, celebrating celebrations, festivities, parties to the gods of the sea. And they utter La ilaha illallah every single day. Is this going to be the correct teeth or tooth or ridge of the key of salvation? No. It is rejected. It will not open the door. And this is the importance of understanding what La ilaha illallah means. It all goes back to knowledge, al ilm, the first condition. Understand what you are declaring. Understand what it means. Understand those things and avoid those things that negate, that oppose Tawheed. How many Muslims today believe in good luck or bad luck? Again, this is not perfecting Tawheed and you have not rejected the worship in other than Allah Ta'ala. Is that understood? Is there a problem there? For anyone? You know, SubhanAllah, Muhammad ibn Azwisha Shafi, he says something very nice. He said, the most sacred thing after the obligations of the fundamentals of faith is searching for knowledge. Knowledge of Tawheed. The most sacred thing after the obligations of the fundamentals of faith is searching for knowledge. In other words, acquire, understand Tawheed. And he would say, I have never ever set a task except I have realized how little I know. And the more I know, he said, the more I realize how ignorant I am. So those that believe that they are elite in knowledge, you are nothing but inferior in knowledge, weak in knowledge. Never ever think that you've encompassed anything. The more I have learned, he said, or the more I know, the more ignorant I realize I am. And who's this? A Shafi'i. A Shafi'i, it's been mentioned that he had to keep, he had to put his hand on the other side of the book so he will not memorize two pages at one time. He would read the page and memorize it instantly. So in order to memorize two pages and confuse himself, he would conceal the other side uh, and memorize the first page. This is a Shafi. And this is the one that says, the more I know, the more I realize how ignorant I am. Number two is al yaqeen Want to rub that out, please, uh, Nazvi, and put al yaqeen which is certainty. Which is certainty. And that opposes doubt and suspicion. So yaqeen is the second condition. In other words, the heart must be firm with full conviction, with full certainty uh, that Allah is the only one worthy of worship. And this must be without the blemish of doubt. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made yaqeen, certainty, a condition of true faith. As he says in Surah Al-Hujarat, verse 1515, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا Indeed, it is only those who believe, truly believe, those who believe in Allah and His Prophet, His Messenger, and then they doubt not. Now we are human beings, and all of us may sometimes doubt, correct? The shaitan comes to us, plays with us, invades our minds, invades our intellect, invades our heart, 
and starts questioning you. You sure this is right? You sure you're on the right path? You sure there's an, a, a creator out there? His name is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only one deserving of worship. We are human beings and you will be examined and no one is safe from this. We all experience this because Allah created us in such a manner. Even the companions had this problem. So what is our duty? What is the best way to cure this disease? And we all know that no disease has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon humanity, no ailment, no sickness, except that Allah gave us a what? A cure, shafa. Likewise, this is a disease. Doubt in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a major disease. So what is the medicine? What is the cure for this disease? Who can tell me? Huh? It's certainty, but how do we get that certainty? You're correct there, but how do we get that certainty? Huh? Al ilm. It all goes back to the first condition knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Do I go to the library and open every single book that exists in the library? Huh? And nourish my mind and my intellect and my brain and my body with gossip? Or what do I do? What kind of knowledge? Is reading the encyclopedia, for example, or the books on animals, or reptiles, or this or that. This is going to cure my disease of certainty or doubt, sorry. What kind of knowledge? Knowledge of the deen. From where? Sound knowledge. Authentic knowledge. Not knowledge from the magicians who claim to be uh, good, righteous, pious people. Knowledge solely, purely from the Quran and the Sunnah. This will clear, wallahi, your doubts. And the more you learn, the more you implement, the stronger and firmer you will be. And the more you remove the opposition of Yaqeen, the enemy of Yaqeen, which is doubt, which is the desire and the lover of Satan, wanting to place doubt upon doubt in that which you strongly hold in your heart. So make sure you seek knowledge. And Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatir, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء It is only those who fear Allah amongst his slaves, those who are knowledgeable. Allah tells us this. So if you are not knowledgeable, you do not fear Allah Ta'ala. Why? Because you don't know Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala wants of you. You don't even know who you are worshipping. If you have no knowledge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, ya nazvi, is ikhlas. Number three is ikhlas. Sincerity. Exclusively worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is exactly what the shahada uh, points to. And Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Bayyinah, verse number 5, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَا They were commanded not. This is Allah Ta'ala telling us, saying it to us. They were commanded not except to worship Allah and to worship Allah alone. Don't worship Allah and then you worship something else. You are rejected in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sadly to say, many, many Muslims, they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or they are Muslims only through traditions that have been passed to them through generations. But that has nothing to do with Islam. How many ladies wear hijab only through tradition? Here in Malaysia, for example, I asked many sisters who look like, besides the hijab, Allahu A'lam who they are. Tight jeans, tight shirt, and they were in hijab. And they're chit-chatting with every dictum and hurry. And they're riding behind the bar on the bikes, 
with every dick, Tom and Harry. I said, what are you wearing the hijab for and you're doing this for? She goes, this is the way we are. It's our culture. Your culture? Well, wallahi, it's not the Islamic culture, not an accepted culture in the sight of Allah Ta'ala. If you are not wearing it for Allah, an ikhlas, you might as well take it off. It is not accepted. Correct? Is it not correct? Because the condition of uttering La ilaha illallah must be built on ikhlas. You are doing it for no other than Allah. And I'm pretty sure that is very blinked, very easily understood, correct? Is there any need for more explanation to that? So due to time, we're going to just be very brief in everyone, inshallah, so we can finish quickly. Number four is as-sidq. What? As-sidq, which is truthfulness, which is the opposition of hypocrisy and dishonesty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that in the days of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were those who claimed to be Muslims, but in reality their hearts are nothing but nifaq, are nothing very good transliteration to barakallah. And nothing but deceit, cheat, deception, lies, falsehood, hypocrisy. They do not really believe, but they utter the declaration of faith saying, La ilaha illallah, but they are not truthful in that declaration. They say that when their hearts is in total opposition of what they say. In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 8 to 10, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَكُولُ آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah Ta'ala is telling us this. And of mankind are those who say that we believe in Allah and the Prophet or the last day, but in fact, they believe not. يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ they think to deceive Allah. Can they deceive Allah for it? Now really, who in the world can ever deceive Allah? But they think those hypocrites to deceive Allah and those believers. Well, in fact, they deceive no one but themselves and they perceive not. Allah tells us. In their heart, a disease, a sickness, a major problem. Hypocrisy, lies. And then Allah increases that sickness in them. And they shall have a painful torment. Why? Because they used to lie. So when we say the declaration of faith, we must make sure we say it with truthfulness. We mean it. We really mean that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. Understood? Any problems? Alhamdulillah. Number five. Al-Mahabba. And Al-Mahabba is a loving, the declaration of faith. And this can only be by loving and having pleasure for everything the declaration necessitates. Having love and pleasure for everything the declaration necessitates. Understood? And again, the verse tells us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us, that there are those people that love others with the same love that should only be deserving for Allah. In Al-Baqarah verse 165, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُوا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And of mankind, of mankind there are those who take for worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as arrivals to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loving them 
with the same love as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then Allah ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ But those who believe, who truly believe, ya Fuad, they love no one or nothing more than, they love nothing more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, they love Allah ta'ala more than anything or anybody uh, that is in this existence. And who are they? Who are they? The true believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the hadith mentions, whoever has the three characteristics of faith will taste the sweetness of faith. Will taste the what? Sweetness. So in other words, if you want the halawa, the beauty of faith, you want the sweetness of Islam, the sweetness of Iman, you should have these three characteristics. The first one being that Allah and His Messenger is more beloved to Him than anything else. Now, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu demonstrated this love very, very beautifully to all of us. When one day he said to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than anyone else except myself. Except who? Myself. Now when Muhammad Sallam heard that statement, what did he say? Good on you, Ya Umar. You're on the right track. What did he say? Because Ya Umar, you have not yet believed. He has not yet believed. And do you love me more than your own self? Now, Umar realized the importance of loving Allah and Rasulullah more than anyone or anything. So immediately he rectified his statement and said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than even myself. To which the Prophet replied, Now, Ya Umar, you have believed. al Ya Umar, al the important thing here to understand is that we must love Allah and we must love everything that Allah loves. And we must only love what He loves. And we must only hate what He hates. And we must only get angry by what He gets angry with. Today, sadly to say, this love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is missing from the majority of the hearts of the Muslims. How many Muslims pray because they know Allah loves them to pray? How many Muslims fast because they know Allah loves fasting? How many Muslims go to Hajj because they know Allah loves Hajj? How many Muslims give Sadaqah because Allah loves Sadaqah? Today is to come to the majority of Muslims Again, I have to do it, or not again. You know, when Ramadan comes, for example, at minimum of one month, people become frustrated, angry, agitated. You cannot even talk to these people one whole month before Ramadan. Why? Because they know they have to fast for 30 days approximately. Subhanallah. This is something that Allah loves. How many Muslims, when they stand up for prayer, they get up in a state of discomfort, distaste. They detest the prayer. They don't want to get up. But, oh, we have to. It's like a chua. And that is all it is. Ya akhwatil a'izza. The acts of worship Allah loves. You should want to do it because Allah loves you to do it. The prayer is one of the most beloved things to Allah. It is extremely heavy, the prayer, except for those who are true believers, al khashin who really know Allah Ta'ala. It is light for them. It is comfort, tranquility, ease, love, desire. They want to pray. And they pray with comfort. Not with finito da musica. Ha! That was hard. 
This is what we're experiencing today. You need to ask yourself before prayer, do you get up easy? Or do you feel like you're procrastinating? Or you're lax? Or you're lazy? Or you feel some kind of unease when prayer comes? When sadaqah comes? When zakat comes? When Ramadan comes? When hajj is obligated upon you? Do you feel discomfort? If you do, there is a problem with your iman. If you do, wallahi, there is a problem that needs to be rectified, reformed, changed. Because this is not fulfilling the fifth condition of the shahada, which is loving the declaration. Having love and pleasure for everything that it necessitates. Do we understand this? Number six. Al inqiyad, ya nazvi, al inqiyad, which is submissive compliance. Submissive compliance. And this can only be by fulfilling the testimony's rights and obligation. This can only be by fulfilling the testimony's rights and obligations. In other words, when you Say, La ilaha illallah. You are saying that, Ya Allah, I have given my total life from A to Z, my flesh and bones, my body, all for Islam, for you completely. In Al An'am, Surah Al An'am, 162, Lillahi Rabbil Alameen La Sharika Lah Wa Bithalika Umirtu Wa Ana Awalul Muslimun Muslimun? Muslimin Naam Ya Habib Al An'am An'am 162 Say my prayer My sacrifice My living And my dying Is for you Ya Allah And only for you he has total submission, total surrender, submissive compliance to whom? To Allah. You are declaring this. You are declaring this. You are saying in reality, from the time I utter the declaration of faith, I am saying from that time forward that I show and I will definitely fulfill all the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without question without that's what you are saying you are saying I repeat when you utter the testimony the declaration the utterance of salvation when you utter it you are actually saying that from that moment onwards forward I shall fulfill the obligations the commands of Allah without question you may not wear hijab. You might not want to wear hijab. You might not like to wear hijab. You might be too scared to wear hijab. But if you say la ilaha illallah, you have no choice but to wear hijab. You might not want to give your zakat. You're too greedy. You're a miser. You're stingy. But if you say la ilaha illallah, you have no choice. You might not want to go for fajr. It's too heavy on me to get up. I find it very heavy. But if you utter La ilaha illallah, you have no choice but to get up. In other words, what La ilaha illallah means is to, to surrender. Submissive compliance, submission. You're giving up your entire life, your entire flesh and bones, your body, your actions, no matter what it entails, what it consists of, to Allah and Allah alone. You know how, what do we say five times a day, Nazmi? Stand up, you come, stand, come here, please. What do we do five times a day? Can you raise your hands, face the people, and do what you do? What you do? Stay there for a sec. Say it out loud. Let this shout be heard. Let this cry be heard to the entire population. What does it mean? Leave your hands up. Raise them a bit higher. Higher. That's it. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. 17 or 18 inch. 
17 or 18 inch? 19! Allahu Akbar. Of fat or muscle? Tabarakallah. Of rock and steel, you're Muslim, mashaAllah. Tabarakallah. What's he doing? Don't put him down until I tell you, huh? This is the essence of a Muslim. And we do this five times a day. Do we understand what we're doing here? Wallahi, we are surrendering. We are submitting. We are giving up our life when we do this. To whom? To Allah. Allahu Akbar. Ya Allah, you are the greatest. You are the greatest. And there is no one like you. There is no power equal to you. This is submission. This is surrender. What do you do if a policeman points his weapon against you? What do you do? What would a wise person do? A wise person will, I give up. Oh, خلاص, خلاص. Don't shoot, don't shoot. Uh -huh. Because if you, shoot, if you don't put your hands up and you do something stupid, he will shoot you and that will be a detriment to your life. But if you raise your hands, yeah, policeman, I surrender, I give up. What are you doing? You're saying, please don't hurt me, I give up. Whatever you want, I'll do. We are doing this every single time. We are raising our hands to the Almighty Allah, the greatest of the greatest, the King of Kings, the Judge of Judges, the Lord of Lords, saying, Ya Allah, please, I have submitted and given my love up to you. Don't hurt me on the day of resurrection. Don't hurt me on the day of resurrection. Don't put me in hellfire. I have submitted to you and only to you. This is ultimate submission. Ultimate submissive compliance. This cry, this shout of Allahu Akbar, Wallahi, worldly powers, the worldly powers evaporate when they hear it. Is there a shout, a cry, more powerful or as equal as Allah? Absolutely not. Nazvi, the pagans, fought this action. The Jews were not happy with it. The Christians uh, did not like it. Have you seen the US dollar bill? What does it say on it? They say, in God we trust. That's the US dollar bill. So the question is asked, why in the world will anyone have a problem with Allah is the greatest? Is it not supposedly the same thing they believe in? Why do people feel provoked? Put your hands up, please. Provoked. Or uncomfortable. Or uneased. Or harassed. Or pressured. Or intimidated. Why do people buckle, break, and shake? Why are they threatened when they shout, Allahu Akbar, Wallahi? They shout where there is no equal power to it. Why are they threatened by it? Zakallah khairan. May Allah reward you, inshallah. Why? Is it not, my dear brothers and sisters, the same thing they already agree with? Is it the same thing for it they agree with? They don't agree to it? But the US dollar bill says, in God we trust. They say, huh? In the Arabic terminology or translation, the tawakkal ala Allah, they say. So they're saying. But why do they have a problem with it? Is it the same as the way we are to it? There is a huge gulf between the way they believe in it and the way we believe in it. It is the reality, the realization of this shout, of this cry, of this mighty call in the lives of every single person. In the hearts of every single person. When a Muslim shouts, utters that Allah is the greatest, you are actually saying that Allah is greater than everything. It is a shout of acknowledgement, a shout of belief, a shout of implementation, a shout of understanding and recognition, a shout of love, of certainty. A shout of submissive compliance. A shout of acceptance. You do make Allah greater in your life more than your father and mother. Greater than your wife 
or your husband greater than your son and your daughter, your brother and sister, your kith, your relatives, your cousins, your friends, greater than your low commanding ego, your inner desires, greater than your beloved ones, greater than the lows of this deceiving materialistic world. That's the definition. That is the difference. Because when a Muslim utters Allahu Akbar, he knows that when Allah is on our side, the power of the world becomes weak, insignificant, illusory, deficient. Does he not? The utterer who utters Allahu Akbar with the correct understanding and implementations knows that when Allah is on his side that the power of the entire existence is nothing the manipulation of the world always saying to us what they can or what they cannot do to us does not affect him he is neither intimidated he is neither pressured he is neither restricted by anything or anyone. But he knows that if Allah is not pleased with us, then the power of the entire world, uh, for him, for the ummah, will be naught, nothing. Now we can see why the claimants to power of this world are threatened by it. Now we can see why the arrogant, the stubborn, the hard-headed individual are buckling and shaking when they hear it. Now we can see those who do not fear the accountability of the day of accountability are scared of it. Because wallahi, whoever does not uphold this testimony, this great call, this great shout of Allahu Akbar, lives, I repeat, lives in darkness, which would lead ultimately to no other than eternal darkness. This is the reality. You know, some brothers did ask me, you know, is Islam so harsh? No, Islam is not harsh. Just recently I was questioned, I get this question always, uh, I confront it many times. They say, does Islam allow the bombing of buses, of trains, of airplanes, of homes, of cars, indiscriminate violence against people, civilians, people sleeping? Are we allowed, in other words, I get this question always asked to me, are we allowed to do these actions in order to make our point heard? The answer, like every other answer, we must go back to where? The Quran and Sunnah. Muhammad ibn Abdullah, ibn Abdi Bunaf, ibn Hashim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What would he have done? And did he ever allow, is the question. Did he ever allow the indiscriminate violence of anyone? Did he ever kill and permit the killing of women, of children, of the unarmed man? The answer is quite clearly no. The answer is what? Quite clearly no. In fact, Islam, the Muslims, we can say, they're the first ones that introduced the rules of engagement, the rules of warfare. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, when he sent the armies in the battles, he said to them, do not kill civilians. Listen to this carefully. And this was because of his predecessors, the way they were taught. Abu Bakr is the Khalifa, the first Khalifa. He said to the armies, quite clearly, do not kill civilians. It's in the history, the authentic history of Islam. Do not kill civilians. Do not cut down trees. Do not destroy the crops. 
Do not poison the water holes. Do not kill women. Do not kill children. Do not kill old men or unarmed men. Islam has never and will never condone ever indiscriminate violence. In fact, this was a thousand years before even the Geneva Conventions or the so-called Declaration of Human Rights ever existed. Islam gave the conditions of warfare. So Islam is not a violent religion, but we need to understand Islam. Number seven and the last, very briefly, which is Al-Qubul. We have to pray Asr, it's getting late. Al-Qubul, which is acceptance. Acceptance. In other words, we must accept Allah's law exactly, purely the way Allah sent it to His messengers. We must abide as Muslims uh, by no other, by Allah's revealed laws. We are not allowed, and I repeat, we must accept it in this way and we are not allowed to blindly follow any madhab, any person, no matter who the person may be. If any evidence comes to us from the Quran and Sunnah, authentic Sunnah, we must abide and uphold it. Anyone that goes against it because he is blind following other than Muhammad this person has not fulfilled the second seventh condition which is al -Qubur. now we said blindly follow just to make sure you understood this you are allowed to follow as a means of methodology or curriculum or syllabus but you are not allowed to blindly follow what is the difference Ali In other words, you say, my opinion, and only my opinion. Because my opinion is the madhab al shafii And whatever al shafii says, no matter what you bring forward to me, I reject it. This is not acceptable. This is not acceptance. This is not fulfilling the condition of the declaration of faith. This is, this is lies. This is gibberish. This is garbage. You are a Muslim? Then be a Muslim. Then be a person that says, no, no, I blindly follow Abu Hanifa, or Malik, or Shafi'i, or Ahmad. No, you blindly follow only Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and no one else. And this is a condition of the utterance of salvation. And last but not least, we say that all of these conditions must be adhered to to one's death. To what? To one's death. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, verse 102, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O you who believe, observe Allah's rights the way they should be observed or fear Allah the way he should be feared and die not except as Muslim which is in other words abiding by these conditions and in Surah Al-Hijr verse Hijr verse 99 worship Allah until certainty which is death comes onto you وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وبارك الله فينا وفيكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وحنين والأحزاب تشهد القائد على المسدد نبينا الهادي